Hello and welcome to the History of the Germans, episode 47, Conrad's Coup. Now this week we'll watch another candidate having the royal title snatched from his fingers. And since the winner is a Hohenstaufen, the whole Stauffer vs. Wealth game kicks off again. More ups and downs than last time though. Now, before we start, just a reminder, the History of the Germans podcast is advertising free, thanks to the generous support from patrons. And you can become a patron too, and enjoy exclusive bonus episodes and other privileges from the price of a latte per month. All you have to do is to sign up at patreon.com, History of the Germans, or on my website, historyofthegermans.com. you find all the links in the show notes. And thanks a lot to Alan, Christopher, and Ian, who've already signed up. Last time, we saw the positively ancient Emperor Lothar III finally succumbing to the strains of office. When he passed away on December 3rd, 1137, in a peasant's hut in Tyrol, he thought his succession was well-ordered. His son-in-law, Henry the Proud, Duke of Bavaria, Duke of Saxony, Margrave of Tuscany, and a huge landowner across Germany and Italy, was his designated heir. He handed him the imperial regalia, the holy lance, the crown, and all the other paraphernalia of imperial rule. The Empress Richesa, Henry the Proud, and his men accompanied the imperial funeral procession to Königslutter in Saxony, the church Lothar had built as a shrine to his memory. There, a great funeral is held on December 31st, 1137. As happened last time round, the nobles present at the funeral, this time mostly Saxons, sent out invitations for an election to be held the day after Pentecost, i.e. May 22nd, 1138, in Mainz. The reason they left a gap of almost five months between the funeral and the election is down to the fact that the Italian campaign has thinned the ranks of the archbishops quite considerably. As of December 1138, there was neither an archbishop of Mainz nor an archbishop of Cologne formerly in office. And as we know too well, having the right archbishop is absolutely key. Well, is it? There is still one of the three Rhenish archbishops available, Albero of Trier. I noticed we rarely talk about Trier and Salzburg, the other archbishoprics. Trier does rank third, which is a problem when there are only two things to do. Managing the election, which is the job of Mainz, and performing the coronation, which is the job of Cologne. The archbishop of Trier ends up just holding the towels at the ceremony. But that does not stop them from being ambitious, and none more so than Albero. Albero was sort of the James Bond of the 12th century Germany. Though a fan of good food and other pleasures, he was also a great spy. Before he became bishop, he attracted the wrath of Emperor Henry V, who put a prize of 500 talents of silver on his head, an enormous sum. He was a master of disguise, pretending to be a merchant, a servant, and often a beggar, dyeing his hair and beard. In the disguise of a beggar, he hid under the table of Emperor Henry V to listen to his plotting against him. Once he wore women's clothing to bring the papal bull of excommunication into the city of Metz. Albero was by far the most ambitious and the most crafty archbishop Trier had yet produced. And then we have a couple of people who are none too comfortable with the idea of Henry the Proud becoming king of the Romans and even emperor. Henry's power, even before he is elected to any office, stretches from sea to sea, from the border of Denmark to Sicily, and he is quite proud of it, as in he really thinks it's all his achievement, rather than his father's smart marriage tactics and his father-in-law's luck and inheritances. So proud and so sure of his election is he, that he does not even bother to sit down with the magnates to do the traditional pre-election chats. I mean, I say chats, but what they really are are hard-nosed negotiations in secret locations where monasteries and counties change hand ahead of elections. Albero, our Archbishop of Trier, may well have been keen on such a chat, since he's been droning on about the monastery of St. Maximin that should by right be his for God knows how long. 
but Henry did not sit down with Albro. He probably already knew what the Archbishop wanted, as the two of them had been on the last Italian campaign together, having lots of opportunity for a chat. As far as Albro was concerned, the road to St. Maximin did not lead via Henry, and Henry was just 32 years old, so the wait could be long. Now, who else? Well, the most obvious ones are the two Hohenstaufen brothers, Conrad, former anti-king and hero of the Italian campaign, and Frederick, Duke of Hohenstaufen. But they were not alone. There's Albrecht the Bear, great Saxon noble and Markgraf of Lusatia and the Northern Marches. He had his own views about the inheritance of Lothar III. His mother had been the daughter of the last Billung Duke of Saxony. Albrecht Hans saw himself as the heir to the ducal authority, not Henry the Proud. As long as Lothar was alive, he could paper over the cracks by awarding Albrecht first Lusatia and then the Northern Marches. But Albrecht did not see this continuing under a wealth regime. Nor did he rate his chances to become Duke once Henry is King. So he started to undermine Henry's election campaign. Lothar's widow, Richesa, had called for a meeting of the Saxon nobles in Quedlinburg, most probably, to confirm the support for Henry's election. Albrecht got there a few days earlier and stole all the food. Richesa did not dare to invite the magnates to an empty table, and so they were not all lined up behind proud Henry. And even more generally, there is a question how keen the princes overall were to make someone king who was called the proud and was already the most powerful man in the land. In fact, more powerful than any candidate for kingship had been since Henry III. Though few opened their mouths, there was sure some groundswell of concern. Finally, there is one who is quite open in his opposition to Henry the Proud, and that is Pope Innocent II. On a personal level, the two had been on bad terms ever since there had been a falling out over the ransom money of Viterbo. But what is more concerning for the Pope is that Henry could be an even more powerful emperor than Lothar III. And most worrying of all, an emperor with great interests in Italy. Henry was Count of Tuscany as well as Count of Este, making him the largest landholder in Italy. And worse, as Innocent had realized during the Italian campaign, the emperor still had unnatural pretensions. They still had not understood that they are papal vassals, who are to kiss his feet, like any other king. As Innocent would write some months later, he felt that Henry was out to suffocate the Holy Mother Church. And hence Innocent had dispatched a cardinal legate, Dietwin, to Germany, probably even before Lothar III had actually died, with orders to prevent an election of Henry the Proud. Now there we are, a small band of opposition is forming against the election of Henry the Proud to become Henry VI. But what can they do? Henry has the imperial regalia. He commands the votes of Saxony and Bavaria, as well as supporters in Swabia and elsewhere. Well, they can at least meet up, which they do on March 7th in Koblenz. And there they debated what can be done. Waiting until the set election day in May can have only one outcome, the election of Henry the Proud. The papal legate tells the electors present that the Holy Church, as well as the bishops, counts and cities of Italy, are supportive of the election of anyone but Henry the Proud. And so encouraged, they decide on what I would call a coup d'etat. Even though there were just a small subset of potential electors, in fact a few bishops, some nobles from Lothringia and the two Stauffer brothers, even though they had none of the necessary archbishops, and even though they had none of the imperial regalia, no crown, no holy lance, no coat, no scepter, and no imperial cross, they decided to elect Conrad of Hohenstaufen to be King Conrad III. Yes, that is that same Conrad who had been excommunicated by Innocent II only five years earlier. Why? Because they could not do anything else. That was on March 7th. Six days later, this motley crew of electors was in Aachen, where the papal legate crowned the Stauffer with some random crown, handing him some random pieces of metal, and declared him Conrad, 
king of the Romans, third of his name. And then there waited. Henry the Proud has a fit when he hears of the events in Koblenz and Aachen. He declares the election invalid, as no Saxons or Bavarians were present, which is correct. He declares the coronation invalid as well, as none of the necessary paraphernalia were available, nor any of the necessary archbishops. And then he calls all his supporters and friends to rise up against the usurper. And then nothing happens. Conrad is now behind the mighty walls of the city of Cologne and calls his first royal assembly. Quite a few people show up, many princes of Upper and Lower Lothringia, but also some bishops, even some bishops from Saxony. Conrad decides that things are going well enough, so that he sets up his government. He appoints his chancellor Arnold, a cleric from Cologne, and he brings Wiebald, abbot of Sablo and Malmedy, into his inner circle. Wiebald had been one of Lothar's closest advisers, which makes this a big win for Conrad III. The papal legate formally installs the new Archbishop of Cologne, who is, no surprise, a supporter of Conrad. So far so good. The next stop is Mainz. There again he receives more support. The city opens its gate and Conrad supervises the election of the new Archbishop of Mainz, another Adalbert, nephew of the previous occupant. Conrad now has the magnates of Lothringia and Franconia in his camp, as well as three archbishops. Things look good enough that he invites all the princes of the realm for an assembly at Pentecost in Bamberg. He invites them to come and receive their fiefs from his hand and to decide the question who would be Duke of Saxony. And so an actual quorum of electors come together in Bamberg, on May 22nd, 23rd, 1138. And I mean, really all of them. The southern dukes of Zeringen and Carinthia, the Babenberger Leopold, new Margrave of Austria, the Duke of Bohemia, and many of Henry the Proud's vassals, counts and magnates from Saxony and Bavaria. The Saxons are there because they do not want Conrad to install Albrecht the Bear as Duke of Saxony. The Bavarians are there, probably for the spectacle of seeing their unloved duke being humiliated. When they are all assembled, the old Empress Richesa tilts the balance in Conrad's favour. She gives up her support for her son-in-law's claim on the throne and hands over the imperial regalia. On that decision, the magnates present swear fealty to their new king, Conrad III of the House of Hohenstaufen. The only one not doing so is Henry the Proud, too proud to show his face or maybe still negotiating terms, but he does not appear. And then there is just a bit of mopping up to do. The Archbishop of Salzburg is placated by Conrad showing him some special favours. That's it. Conrad and Henry then negotiate for three days before Augsburg over the Duchy of Saxony and the Duchy of Bavaria. But they cannot reach an agreement. As the debate gets heated, Conrad is getting worried about the large retinue of armoured knights Henry had brought with him. In the depth of the night, Conrad flees from Augsburg. He rides to Würzburg where he assembles a court of princes, all solid supporters of the Hohenstaufen, who put Henry the Proud into the imperial ban. Henry is stripped of his title as Duke of Saxony and his position is handed over to Albrecht the Bear. Six months later, he also deposes him as Duke of Bavaria and installs his half-brother Leopold, Markgraf of Austria, as the new duke. It is 1138 and we are watching a rerun of the year 1125, just with inverse prefixes. Two candidates compete for the title, one Hohenstauf and one Welf. The churchmen tilt the election outcome to suit their interests. Hohenstauf and Welf go to war over royal rights and privileges, the other kept from the previous regime. And who wins? The princes and the church, as before. Who loses? the peasants that are in the way of the armoured knights. War is taking place in two main areas. One is Saxony, where Conrad's ally, Albrecht the Bear, fights the old Empress Richesa, and Swabia, where Henry the Proud's brother, whose name is Welf VI, is fighting the brand new Duke of Bavaria, Leopold. In Saxony, things were initially off to a decent start. 
Albrecht the Bear can occupy Lüneburg, the centre of wealth possessions, and pushes the old Empress hard. By Christmas, Conrad believes that everything is sorted and calls for an assembly in Goslar to effectively settle the conflict, make everybody accept Albrecht as Duke and be done. He arrives in Goslar with just his bodyguard and entourage, indicating he comes to make peace. But most of the important Saxon leaders do not show, in particular the old empress and the archbishop of Magdeburg. Conrad twiddles his thumbs for a month, hoping he can convince all parties to come to another assembly in February in Quedlinburg. And this time they do show, but they do show with a large army. Amongst them is now Henry the Proud himself, who had fought his way back home from Augsburg. Conrad looks at the enemy army, counts his own soldiers, and does the same thing as he did in Augsburg. He ran. A running king, even if he's indeed running for his life, is not an edifying sight, in particular in the middle of a civil war. Even Albrecht the Bear cannot keep the supporters of Conrad together. One by one, they go over to Henry. Three months later, Albrecht and his few remaining allies have to leave Saxony. Henry is back in charge of the largest and the most important German duchy. In May 1139, the princes of southern Germany commit to undertake a campaign against Henry the Proud. Our old friend Archbishop Albero of Trier is the most enthusiastic. He provides 500 knights instead of the just 20 he's required to bring. Not just that, but being a jolly churchman, he also brings food and drink. We are told he brought 30 fooder of finest Moselle wine, that is equivalent to about 30,000 litres. When this well-equipped force meets the army of Henry the Proud in August, the two sides measure each other up and then do something we have seen happening several times before. The bishops realise that the battle could go either way, and decide it is better to negotiate. And so they do. In the end, Henry pretty much wins. He's confirmed in the possession of Saxony and the parties agree an armistice for the next nine months. Then, Albero brings on his 30,000 litres of wine and they have one hell of a work event. Except for Conrad and Albrecht, who sit in the tent most likely exchanging choice words about the prelate's peaceable nature. After this fiasco, the last remaining supporters of Conrad and Albrecht's cause return to Saxony, making peace with Henry the Proud. In Bavaria, the situation is more advantageous for the Hohenstaufen, at least initially. The wealth had become quite unpopular, probably because they were trying to introduce a tight governmental structure. Conrad's new duke, Leopold, is quickly established, and takes his seat in the old Bavarian capital, Regensburg. Conrad provides him with some more help by installing his brother Otto as Bishop of Freising and his brother Conrad as Bishop of Passau. All these brothers were sons of that exceptionally reproductive Agnes of Weiblingen we mentioned in episode 43. Otto of Freising is best known as a historian who wrote two books, one a world chronicle covering the whole of history from Adam and Eve to the reign of King Henry V. It ends in sad contemplation of the end of the world, as Pope and Emperor had fallen out, a clear portent of the coming of the Antichrist. And then, in his later years, he will be asked by his nephew, Frederick Barbarossa, to write up his reign, where he puts a much more optimistic spin on things. He is also one of the main sources for this period, which he experienced firsthand. The new Duke of Bavaria, Leopold, is now well settled and holds a ducal assembly, where pretty much the whole of the duchy shows. Henry's brother, Ralph VI, did not, but that was not to be expected. The wealth are now preparing to get their old duchy back. Remember, they had received this duchy not by the generosity of Lothar III, it had been in the family for more than a century, and part of the reconciliation between Henry IV and the Welf was that Bavaria would forever remain within their family. How could they, why would they, ever give it up? As Henry was mustering his army in October 1139, 
he suddenly keels over and dies. He was just 35 years old. Rumors swirl around Saxony immediately thereafter, suggesting he had been poisoned. The rumor found credibility when Albrecht the Bear suddenly appeared and pretended he was again Duke. But he found no support. The Saxons insisted that the ten-year-old son of Henry the Proud, also Henry, should be Duke, and his grandmother, the old Empress, be Regent. Albrecht lost his last strongholds in Saxony, even his family home in Anhalt was razed to the ground. With Saxony all but lost, the woes continued. Duke Leopold's position in Bavaria began to get wobbly. Two counts rebelled and supported by Ralph the Sixth, inflicted a painful defeat on the Duke. Conrad needed a success badly, like very badly. And so he attacked one of Ralph the Sixth's most important positions, the town and castle of Weinsberg near Heilbronn. If you ever drive from Heidelberg to Nuremberg or from Stuttgart to Würzburg, you cannot miss the impressive ruins of the castle of Weinsberg. It sits on top of a near-perfect cone, its slopes covered in vines. In 1140, Conrad III had brought almost his entire army down there to break the wealth power in northern Swabia. The garrison held out, waiting for their lord to relieve them. And Wealth the Sixth did indeed arrive, but was heavily defeated by Conrad and his brother, Frederick the Duke of Swabia. The garrison surrendered. And the story goes that Conrad allowed the women of Weinsberg free passage with all valuables they could carry on their shoulders. The ladies of the town, worried about the fate of their husbands and boyfriends, decided to carry them down the hill. And it was said that many a sturdy mate was able to finally find love. When the women came down the hill, Conrad's aides called foul play and asked the king whether they should arrest the men. But Conrad said, and no, a king's word is a king's word, and so he let them pass. Now this story may well be made up. There are several such stories circulating about other castles as well, but none is so famous, at least in Germany, as this one. The castle of Weinsberg is, until this day, called Weibertreu, which translates as wifely loyalty. The story has several epilogues. The castle was finally destroyed during the Peasants' War of 1525 and in 1819 a local group of women began collecting funds for the renovation of the castle that stabilized the existing structure. In 1855, the architect of the famous Schloss Liechtenstein, which is on almost every third picture tagged Germany on Facebook, suggested the construction of a pantheon of famous German women. That failed due to opposition of the Württemberg authorities. Joseph Goebbels picked up the idea and planned a great Valhalla of the German women to be inaugurated in 1940. The outbreak of World War II prevented this awfulness. So, we are left with the beautiful ruins of Weinsberg, still managed by the Frauenverein, the women's association founded in 1819, and no man built anything over it. Do I believe the story of Weibertreu? Yes, I sort of do, and the reason is quite prosaic. In 1140, Conrad III's reputation was in tatters. He had fled Saxony twice, his Duke of Bavaria had been humiliated by Wealth the VI, and his castles overrun and peasants killed. Assuming the women of Weinsberg did indeed pull this stunt, Conrad realized that this was a great opportunity to rebuild his reputation as a magnanimous ruler. And it may have worked. It took another year of brutal fighting in Bavaria for the position of Duke Leopold to be restored. The momentum did not even stop when Leopold unexpectedly died. Conrad III then appointed another of his half-brothers, Henry, called Jasomirgott, as Duke of Bavaria, where his nickname, which translates roughly as Yes, with the help of God, comes from, is unclear. But it is helpful, as we by now have far too many Henrys cluttering up our narrative. Several events paved the road to peace in Saxony. Empress Richesa, who had been relentless in her effort to regain all the wealth possessions for her grandson, had died in 1141. 
Albrecht the Bear had conceded that he would never become Duke of Saxony, so reverted back to calling himself just a Margrave and began negotiations with the Saxon leaders. In May 1142, the Saxon magnates, including the mother of the little Duke Henry, appeared at an assembly at Frankfurt. The parties agreed to end the conflict over Saxony. Conrad III accepted young Henry as the legitimate Duke of Saxony. In exchange, little Duke Henry, soon to be known as Henry the Lion, represented by his mother and a council of his magnates, gives up his claim on Bavaria. To seal the deal, Henry's mother Gertrude, the daughter of Emperor Lothar III, marries Henry Jasomirgott of Bavaria. Albrecht the Bear gets his old possessions in Saxony back. That, everyone thought, should close down the war for good. Well, it did, and it did not. There was one person nobody had asked, and that was Valve the VI, the uncle of Henry the Lion Cup. Valve the VI did not see any reason to give up. In fact, he now claimed Bavaria as his own, since Henry's renunciation made him, Valve the VI, the true heir to the duchy. Valve the VI will keep fighting the good fight for almost the whole of Conrad's reign, making it hard for him ever to leave the country, for instance, to get the imperial crown in Italy. Likewise, Conrad III had very little, if any, authority in Saxony throughout his reign. In the 19th century retelling of the story, the election of Conrad III is often seen as another one in the string of disasters brought upon the German nation by the hateful papacy. If Henry the Proud had been elected, and then not poisoned, imperial power could have been restored back to the glory days of Henry III and even before. The wealth rulers, having control of Bavaria and Saxony, could have created the institutions that the empire so sadly lacked and that were taking shape in France. Their interest in the East could have given the empire a new purpose, away from the entanglement with the unsavoury affairs of Italy. And that would have led directly to a strong and confident German national state avoiding the horrors of the Thirty Years' War and the humiliation of the Napoleonic occupation. A lot of what-ifs and long-range hypothetical outcomes. And in no way had Henry the Proud an interest in, or any faint notion of, creating a German national state. But still, Pope Innocent II's fear of Henry as emperor is a clear sign even contemporaries were expecting a very different outcome under wealth rule. As it happens, we now have King Conrad III. Yes, he was a weak king, but that will not stop him mounting one of the largest military campaigns the empire had seen to date. Whether that succeeds, we will see next week. I hope you will join us. And in the meantime, should you feel like supporting the show and getting hold of those bonus episodes, sign up on Patreon. The links are in the show notes or on my website at historyofthegermans.com. <laughs>